The road trip had been Malcolm's idea, and as his ideas went, it wasn't terrible. We were around 23 or 24 at the time, and we both just finished college. Having just spent the past few years working towards a degree, I think we both needed the downtime. Graduation seems great, right up until you realize that you're staring down the barrel of an abyss. Suddenly, you don't really know what your future looks like. School has a kind of structure to it. There's a timeline. As soon as that runs out, it's easy to feel lost. Malcolm handled it better than I ever did. He looked at that lack of attachment to everything around him and decided it gave him carte blanche to run in whatever direction he felt like for as long as he pleased. Honestly, I admired that. It's why I said yes when he asked me if I wanted to come with. The only thing I had to look forward to was job hunting, parking my ass in an office, and settling down. So why not wander for a bit? What was the worst that could happen? After a couple of days of planning, we set out one morning with nothing but a couple of bags packed with just the things we needed. The highway out of town ran either north or south. We flipped a coin to decide where we were going. Heads north, tails south. It came up heads. So with no destination in mind, we took the highway north as far as it would take us. Then we found another road and followed that. Rinse and repeat. We slept in the car or in cheap motels. We lived off road snacks, fast food, and greasy spoon diner fare. Malcolm liked to hit up the bars and clubs when he found them, although that was never really my scene. Part of me wishes that it was. Lord knows I tried but I never really felt all that comfortable in those places. I don't know, something about the loud music and obligation to get blackout drunk doesn't appeal to me. I've tried it, it's not for me. On the nights where Malcolm would head back to whatever motel room we'd rented with some questionable piece of ass he'd picked up, I slept in the car and let him take care of business. Between the two of us, he was more of a ladies' man. I don't know, I guess he just had a sort of charisma to him. Part of me was jealous of it, but I never really held it against him. We'd been on our wandering road trip for only about a month and a bit when we rolled into a town called Whittier. Whittier was small, small enough that I don't even remember seeing it on the map. We'd been touring some back roads near dusk, looking for a diner to eat at and maybe a motel to sleep in, when I saw a road sign telling us that Whittier was straight ahead, just 20 kilometers. The landscape around us was mostly flat farmland. In the distance, I could see some rolling mountains and forest, but not much. The only features that stood out as far as I could see were some distant power lines that were silhouetted against the setting sun and a large white tower just ahead of us with a single red light, slowly flashing so it could be seen in the dark. There were a few older houses along the road, although they were few and far between. Usually, houses out in the country like that are a little bit nicer, but the ones in Whittier looked small and run down. Some of them looked even straight up abandoned. I caught Malcolm eyeing some of them, almost a little suspiciously, but he never said anything. He didn't need to. We were both probably thinking the same thing. What a shithole. A little farther up the road, we reached the main drag of Whittier, which wasn't much to ride home about. If you've seen the main drag of one small backroads town, you've more or less seen them all. Old brick buildings, lots of small businesses, most of them abandoned. I did catch Malcolm eyeing a pub we passed with a familiar look. The name on the sign said Rudy's, and at a glance, it looked seedy as hell. I doubted that would deter him though. As we passed by the main drag, I could see the white tower looming closer. And just at its base, I spotted a bright sign reading, Monarch Hotel, and underneath, that Monarch Grill. It would have to do. I gave Malcolm a light tap on the shoulder, and he nodded at me, before pulling into the parking lot. The Monarch looked just as dumpy as the rest of the town, but it would suffice. It was barely a step up from a motel, having a second floor, despite the fact that there was almost no way they could have filled those rooms. The White Tower, which I assumed to be some sort of radio tower, loomed behind the building and I couldn't help but find it a little ominous as I looked up at it. Still, we'd stayed in worse places. 
there had been one motel a few weeks back where the septic tank and the shower drain had been connected. And the shower drain had started spitting our own shit back at us. So long as that didn't happen, we'd probably be happy. Gee, I wonder if they got any vacancies. Malcolm said under his breath as he looked around the parking lot. I counted four cars there, including our own. I had a feeling most, if not all of them, belonged to staff. He patted me on the shoulder and gestured for me to follow him inside. The front office looked as if it was almost a hundred years old in terms of decor. I guess they were trying to look classy, but it just looked dusty and dated. Not that either of us really cared. The red carpet probably could have used a cleaning, and the brass fittings on everything looked worn, but otherwise the place wasn't that bad. There was a woman behind the desk who looked to be somewhere in her mid-fifties and used too much makeup reading a mystery novel who only barely acknowledged us as we walked in. When she did, she put down her book with the annoyed reluctance of an upset teenager. Evening, boys. How can I help you? Evening. Are there any rooms available? Malcolm asked. The woman just scoffed. What do you think? Fifty per night plus a deposit. I can set you up with two rooms, one room with two beds, one room. The last part was a question as her eyes darted between us. <laughs> yeah, two beds would be fine, thanks. Malcolm said as he reached into his pocket for his wallet. You guys take credit? Sure. Nice. Hey, by the way, how's that bar in town? Rudy's. The clerk just shrugged as she took his card. It's booze. Good enough. Nice, Malcolm said as he looked over at me, grinning as he offered a silent invitation. Nah, man, I'm good, I said. Might stop off and grab some dinner, though. Your call, man. I'll see you back at the room after then. The clerk gave us each a key and returned Malcolm's credit card. By the way, she said right before he could take off, we've got a policy here for guest safety. I'm assuming you noticed that old siren tower out back, right? If it goes off, all guests must remain indoors. Yeah, sure thing, Malcolm said. What is that thing, anyway? Thought it was a radio tower or something. Is it like a weather warning or something? Something like that, the clerk said. Don't worry too much about it. Just stay indoors if you hear anything. It's safer that way. Yeah, sure thing, Malcolm said, although I could tell he really didn't care. He grinned at me, tossed me his car keys, and then took off. I let him go and headed out to the car to bring our bags inside. We didn't have much. The hotel room was pretty bare. There were two twin beds and a bathroom. That was really it. There wasn't even anything hung on the walls. The paint looked old, and the carpet absolutely had never been cleaned. The liners smelled a little stale, but the mattress seemed decent enough. We'd slept on worse. All things considered, it wasn't that bad. There was one thing that did stand out to me, though, as slightly off. There was a large sign taped on the inside of the door to our room. Warning. If the siren is active, do not go outside. Please remain indoors until the siren has stopped. Odd, but it probably was just a weather warning. Maybe this area got notoriously bad storms or something. It was hard to say for sure. I didn't bother unpacking anything. I dropped our bags beside one of the beds and checked them over before flopping down. After hours of sitting, laying down was a nice change for a few minutes. Then I decided it was time to do something about my hunger. There'd been a restaurant attached to the hotel, the Monarch Grill. For lack of any better options, that seemed to be like the only place to go for dinner. So I figured I'd check it out. I'd seen an entrance back through the lobby, so once I was done enjoying the moderate comforts of the bed, I headed back that way. The clerk had gone back to her mystery novel and barely looked up at me as I passed her by. The glass double doors to the Monarch Grill looked like they'd once tried to be fancy with their brass trim. Although the restaurant that was waiting for me on the other side wasn't anything special, I can't really tell just what kind of look it was going for. The booths looked like they'd been torn out of a 50s diner. 
The decor zigzagged between Art Deco and cheap steakhouse. It felt like a disingenuous attempt to be upscale in a place where nobody could probably afford it. I wonder just how the hell a place like this ever made any money. There was only one other patron at that restaurant, sitting in one booth near the front. A cute girl with short and wavy red hair. She had dark rimmed glasses and pink rose earrings. It was the earrings that stood out to me the most. There was something charming about them. She was playing solitaire at her table with a half-eaten plate of something beside her, and I caught her eyeing me as I stepped inside. She only glanced at me for a moment before going back to her game. I grabbed a booth close to the door and waited. There was one waiter there, a bored-looking young man who seemed to avoid me for as long as he could before bringing me a menu. He took off again before I could do so much as order a drink. The menu looked, well, standard. There were a few cuts of steak that I didn't trust, so I instead opted for something simple. Just a burger. Maybe I'd even get to order it tonight. I set the menu down just in time to see that the cute girl who'd been playing solitaire had gotten up and was sliding into the booth across from me with a wry smile on her lips. Pick a card, she said as she fanned out her deck in front of me. I looked down in it, then back up at her before selecting a random card from the deck. The Seven of Hearts. All right, now put it back in, but don't show me which card you picked, she said. I wearily did as she asked. I slid the card in close to where I'd found it, then watched as she shuffled the deck before setting it down on the table. All right, what was your card? Seven of hearts, I think, I said, and as I spoke, she fanned the deck across the table, revealing one face-up card amongst the deck. The two of spades. Her expression soured a little before she sheepishly put the deck away. Ah, oh, shit, I'm sorry, I, uh... Did you want to try again? I asked, trying to be polite. Would you mind? She asked. I really thought I had it that time. I mean, it was still kind of cool, I said. I was just trying to lift her spirits, and I think she saw through it, but still, she smiled anyway. Well, glad you thought so. I'm Olivia, by the way. Nice to meet you. She offered a hand to shake. Yeah, likewise. I'm Jeff. Um, you live around here, or? She shrugged. For now, I guess. I travel around. I'm a busker, you know. Street magic. I'm on my way to Montreal for the Busker Fest. I just stopped here for the night. She shuffled her deck again. What about you? I can't imagine you're from around here either. I'm not, I admitted. My friend and I are just kind of on a road trip. Really? Nice. How's that working out for you? I shrugged. It's not bad. I'm enjoying it. I guess it's nice to just kind of be able to go out, you know, see the world, explore. You know, that's kind of why I wanted to get into busking, Olivia said. I mean, if it doesn't work out, I can find something a little more stable, but I'd kick myself if I never tried, you know? She spread the deck out before me again. All right, all right, second time's a charm. Pick a card, then put it back, but don't let me see which card you took. I gingerly reached out and took one. The four of hearts. Then when prompted, I put it back into the deck. She shuffled it just like she had before and then fanned the deck out again. Sure enough, the four of hearts was facing up. Hey, that's my card, I said, and she let out the cutest squeal of delight that I'd ever heard. Yes, I got it. Wait, you're serious, right? You're not just saying that to make me feel better. No, no, you actually got it, I assured her. She pumped her fist in triumph. She started to put the cards away, but before she could, I couldn't help but ask, You got any other cool tricks? The smile on her face could have brightened a room. Card tricks turned into card games, and we talked over Crazy Eights and Blackjack as I waited the hour and a half it took the otherwise unoccupied cook to make a burger. Honestly, it wasn't that bad having to wait. The company was good. Olivia and I chatted as we played and we ate. 
We talked about our lives, where we'd come from, and where we hoped to go. She'd been doing magic ever since she was a child, and she wanted to strike it big someday. I admired her willingness to go out and chase her dream, even if it was a long shot. Not a lot of people have that kind of drive, and listening to her talk about magic was nothing short of enthralling. There's something about it when people talk about the things they're passionate about that makes it more interesting. All in all, I'd say I was having a pretty damn good night. It was more fun than I would have had at whatever seedy bar Malcolm had screwed off to. I finished my dinner and Olivia was reshuffling the deck when she got a wry look in her eye. You know anything about poker? I've played once or twice, I said. I don't really have much to put up though. Well, we don't need to play for money, she said. Why don't we head up to your room? More privacy that way. By that glint in her eye, I caught her meaning very quickly and I couldn't have said yes fast enough. I led her back up to my room, which according to her was just as plain and dingy as hers was, and we sat on the bed before she dealt the cards. I'm not exactly the best poker player in the world, but let's just say I cleaned her out, even if I wasn't completely focused on the cards. Olivia was… well, Olivia was gorgeous. And I think I knew what would have happened next if the siren hadn't gone off. We were in the middle of our pleasant evening when I heard it, coming on suddenly and loud enough to make both of us jump. The sound was loud and droning, not like any alarm we'd heard before. It was more like an air raid siren with an eerie echo to it. I thought it was a distant car horn at first, but no, it couldn't have been. Olivia asked me what it was, immediately concerned. I got up and went to the window, moving the curtain aside slightly to look out into the darkness. There was no sign of rain outside, no hint of a storm, just that ominous droning and an abandoned street. Jeff? I think it's the siren, I said. You know, that big one on the tower behind the hotel. That's the siren? She asked, frowning. I looked down at the parking lot. I saw a few people running inside the front door of the hotel, but nothing else. Do you see anything? Olivia asked. I shook my head. Nothing. Not at first, anyway. I was about to close the window curtain and rejoin her when I noticed something in the darkness ahead of us. It was almost impossible to see it clearly. Against the blackness of the night sky, I couldn't make out the shape of it. But there was something giving it away. A slight reflection shining off of it. Or maybe those lights were part of it. Whatever it was. Jeff? She joined me beside the curtain and paused when she noticed the same thing I had. There was something far in the distance. Something coming ever closer to the town of Whittier. Part of it seemed to pulsate with strange lights. They had to be coming from the thing itself. They couldn't have been reflections. With every step forward, I felt the earth shake slightly, and it lurched forward. Its gait seemed shambling, stiff, odd. It didn't make any noise. After a while, even the trembling of the earth seemed to subside as it got closer, as paradoxical as that sounds. Olivia and I watched that thing in silence, as the sirens blared around us. The thing drew closer and closer, moving towards Whittier and seeming to quake and shift in form with every step forward. Beside me, I saw Olivia's eyes widen. I saw the question that was on her mind. It was the same question that was on my mind. What the hell is that thing? Even as it got closer and I started to make out some of its features, I couldn't identify it as anything I recognized. Aside from a set of stiff limbs, I couldn't see any identifying features on it. Nothing resembling a face or a head. I thought I saw a neck, but it was hard to be sure. The thing just seemed to get larger the closer it got. I felt Olivia's hand reach for mine and grab it tight. I held hers in turn. 
and we stared into the unknown, watching that which we could never hope to understand, and in its presence, all we could feel was quiet awe accompanied by an uneasy dread. If this thing was getting closer, would it flatten us? Would it crush the Monarch Hotel and kill us both? Maybe we'd be safer if we ran to the car and got the hell out of Dodge. But somehow, running didn't seem like a good idea. I glanced back towards the door where the sign was posted. Warning, if the siren is active, do not go outside. Please remain indoors until the siren has stopped. Heeding that warning seemed like the smartest thing that either of us could do. We looked out at that massive thing as it drew nearer to the town, towering over it as it stepped over the main drag. Not through it. It went over it. I could feel a strange static in the air around us that I hadn't noticed before. I realized that it had grown slowly as that thing had gotten closer, and as it stepped over Whittier, it became strong enough that it actually seemed to tickle my skin. Olivia and I both watched as the thing stepped over the downtown area and began to move off into the other direction. It passed the hotel, and with just a few more steps, it had disappeared from our view. I felt Olivia release a breath I didn't realize she'd been holding. Her grip on my hand loosened slightly. But that sense of dread hadn't passed yet. The static in the air seemed just as bad as it had been before. Whatever that thing was, it wasn't gone yet, and it would be at least another few minutes before it was. I didn't feel my muscles slacken until I felt that static fading away. Olivia looked pale and shaken. I couldn't blame her. I didn't bother asking her if she knew what that thing was. I doubted she did. But when she asked if she could spend the night with me, I said yes. We didn't sleep, and we didn't do anything else. We just sat together in silence for a while before laying down together and seeing if sleep would come. It didn't. It wasn't until a few hours later that I started thinking about Malcolm. When Malcolm wasn't back at the hotel by five, I went out to look for him. By then the siren had subsided, and all was quiet. I saw a few cars on the roads, but the front desk of the Monarch Hotel was abandoned. I tried calling Malcolm's cell. I didn't even get his voicemail. The phone would ring and then stop. Olivia and I drove down to Rudy's. We didn't see any trace of him on the road there, and the bar was closed when we got there. It didn't open up again until 11, and when we went in, nobody there could tell us anything about Malcolm. We contacted the police. We spoke to the hotel's front desk, and nobody told us anything. Hell, it felt like nobody did anything. Whenever I mentioned that he disappeared the same night that the siren went off, they'd get quiet and make excuses like, maybe your friend left town without you. Olivia and I couldn't spend another night at the Monarch, not if it meant risking seeing what we'd seen again. Part of me didn't want to leave Whittier, but part of me felt like I had no choice. In the end, I left with Olivia. It seemed like the only thing I could have done. The police didn't even declare Malcolm a missing person. I spoke to him. I tried to get whoever I could to help me find my friend. I even called his family and told them as much as I could, but nothing. In the end, I ended up going to Montreal with Olivia. We spent a week there. I learned some car tricks, and then I headed home. She had nowhere better to be so she stuck by my side. I appreciated that. We'd only had one night together, but what we'd seen had given us something deeper to share. We've been married for three years now. We don't talk about our night in Whittier, and when people ask how we met, we omit certain details. I will never truly know what happened that night. I'll never understand just what it was that we saw, nor will I ever know what became of my friend Malcolm. I've never gone back to Whittier, but I've kept an eye on the place.
Every now and then, someone disappears there, usually at night or in the early morning. The police never investigate it. Nobody ever goes looking for them. I'm not even sure if the people who live there truly know the reason why. Sometimes there are no answers. There is no closure. None that you can fully comprehend, at least. I suppose that maybe there's one way to know for certain what happened that night. I'll admit, I've considered driving out to Whittier and waiting for the siren, just so I can see it again. But I don't know if the answers I'm looking for are worth dying for. <laughs>